life, and I am thankful that you guys are here on this beautiful Memorial Day weekend. Man, how many people are now excited for snow again? Anybody? I, I am. <laughs> Man, I tell you, one of the fun things that we've been doing in our car, my son loves numbers, absolutely loves numbers, and he has not seen the temperature in our car get above 95 degrees. And so he is really excited for today because it could beat that. And they're saying maybe a hundred tomorrow in some places. So yeah, we're setting record, <laughs> setting record temperatures all over the place. Even though I'll tell you the record I've seen in my car was 117. I was in Fresno, California. We we're going from San Jose into Yosemite National Park. We're in the valley, 117 degrees. You stepped outside, it was just awful absolutely awful and we drove by a church and on their billboard it said if you think this is hot <laughs> which i thought was one of the best uses of a church billboard i've ever seen that was that was great but on this Memorial Day weekend, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the church, and I think it's appropriate that we're talking about the church on Memorial Day weekend because one of the things that we are blessed with in this country is the ability to gather together in church, that we have the freedoms, and that's one of the things that I remember over and over and over again every Memorial Day weekend, that this is an opportunity for us to freely worship the God that we serve. Memorial Day weekend has a special meaning for me, too. This was actually my last weekend at my last church. And so I will always remember this weekend as an opportunity to worship God in his goodness and his grace and his mercy, but not take it for granted. And that we are here for a reason, that we are here for a purpose, and that God is working. And so we're talking today about the church, and we're talking a little bit about what it means to be the church. So just a real quick recap, we're in our series, Why We Believe What We Believe. We've been talking about our statement of faith, the doctrinal statement here at New Life Church, and we've been going through the different things that have led us to this point. So our foundation is the Bible, tells us who God is, that we need him, we need to be regenerated through him, we need new life, and then we need to live that out in our world today. And so how does that happen? And that happens primarily through the church. So what is the church? What do we believe the church to be? Well, if I were to ask you that question, what is your perception of the church? What do you think about church? What would you tell me? I'd probably get two answers quite regularly. They'd be the building and the people. And maybe even in that order. In fact, if you were to ask me my thoughts of the church, I typically think of the church as a building. As much as I've tried, as much as I think of the people, I think of it as a building. Primarily because of my background. When I went to church, I went to a building. Now, I think about the people in the church quite regularly. But I've been fascinated with church for many, many years, which is probably a good thing because I'm a pastor. <laughs> but one of the things that I've really enjoyed about churches is the buildings that people gather in to do church. It's interesting. It's absolutely fantastic if you have an opportunity to do this, to study what church buildings look like and where do people gather? Where do people congregate to worship? And it's different all over the world. I've had an opportunity to be in a number of different churches. And I'll tell you, I enjoy going through many Orthodox Catholic churches. They are gorgeous. Absolutely beautiful. In fact, one of the most beautiful churches I've been in was a number of years ago. I was in Moldova. And I had a chance to be in the Moldovan National Church. And here's a picture of it. This is the official Orthodox Church. It's the Cathedral of Christ's Nativity, and it's the main cathedral in Moldova, right in the center of town. It was built in 1830, and obviously some things have been done to it since then, but I just remember walking into this building, and you were immediately in awe. You just had to stand there. Now, one of the sad things about this church is they don't actually do church services here anymore. In fact, it's only a monument. You can tour it. You're not supposed to take pictures of it. This I actually got online, so don't worry. I didn't break their rules. You're not supposed to take pictures. You're supposed to come in, and it's supposed to be a time of being very solemn and worshipful. In fact, many churches, Catholic churches, if you've been in them here in the United States, are similar in nature. I had a chance a number of years ago to be in St. Louis, and I was able to go to the Basilica Cathedral of St. Louis. If you've ever been there, it is enormous. And you walk in, and the first thing you want to do is just be quiet. And you just want to stand in awe. 
And there's something about that. So when I think of the building, and I understand, and we'll talk here about the building isn't the church. But when you think about the building, there's something worshipful about the building. If you've had a chance to go to the cathedral here in St. Paul, it's free. Do it. Go. Check it out. Again, absolutely beautiful. Read all of the plaques that they have. Understand its history. Know why it is there. And hopefully you walk away with this feeling of awe. That's what church buildings do to me. That's why I think of the building probably primarily because there's this sense of awe, the sense of this is a holy place that we can go. Now, contrast that, though, with my experience. I've never actually done a church service in one of those buildings. I've walked through them. I've been in awe of them. But this next picture is a picture of the church that I grew up in, which is not like the last picture at all. This is a church in Osage, Iowa. This is a Christian and Missionary Alliance church in Osage, Iowa. And I have extremely fond memories of this church. In fact, I can tell you every square foot of this church. That was the main door right there on the left. You go in the main door and you walk into a landing. If you went upstairs to the left was the scary part of the building. Because that's where the church office was, where the pastor's office and the library. And nobody ever went over there. And if you took a right, you'd go into the worship center, which is on the second floor. But the best part of this building was if you went in those main doors and you went down to the left, it created a circle. You could literally run down the stairs, run through the hallways, come back up, and there was a door right here towards the end of the building. You could run out that door and do it again. (laughs) And we used to run that loop over and over and over again. And then, you know, it had the old poles in the middle, and it had the partitions that you'd pull, and it was your stereotypical church at the time. Now, the scary part of this, too, was that door right there. If you went up the next flight of stairs, because it was kind of a split level, that took you right to the stage. And we had a couple times where individuals were running the building, right? We'd get a little crazy or something would happen, and we'd forget that church was still going because we had like a free time or a play time or something. And there were kids that would burst through that door right onto the stage, (laughs) right in the middle of the service. And the piano was right there, right? You know, you never move the piano. It stays in the same spot all the time. That's a joke. (laughs) The piano stayed in the same spot every time. And so it was inevitable that it was like one of the last songs, right? You're towards the end of the service. And I'm not going to tell you the name of the individual that played the piano, but she could give you this look. And you knew. Whoop! And you'd turn around and run back down those stairs. Well, then this next picture is a picture of the church that I just came from. This was in Illinois, in Naperville, and this is an office building, right? And you're seeing the progression through churches. I'm doing this for a reason. Church isn't necessarily the building, but it's unique, and it's interesting to see the buildings that God uses for his people to gather. This was a three-story office building. Walk in the main doors right to the right. That whole first floor was the worship center. We completely blew everything out, put a worship center in there. If you went to the left, that was where our uh, early childhood and up through kindergarten was. If you go up to the second floor, we had the whole second floor for elementary and for our youth. And then half of the third floor were office buildings, or not office bu- or offices in the office building, and then other offices as well. And so it was neat to use a facility like that because it wasn't just a church. It was a landing place for the community. It was individuals that would come in, and God had put us there for a specific reason at that specific time. And then obviously we're sitting in a building right now, which is different than the three of those. And there's a whole other side of this facility that's used for a different part of what we do as a ministry than what we're doing right now. And yet each church has a different flair, has a different feel, has a different purpose. But I tell you, I have to love, I have to tell you, I love being here at this church. We just had an opportunity on Friday to uh, say farewell to our teachers for the summer, which was great. We have an academy within the building as well. And I had a chance to kind of pray over the teachers and, you know, wish them a farewell as the summer came. And it was great to be here to see the energy and excitement for the year to be over, (laughs) as well as for next year. And I told them, and I believe this, in the different churches I've been a part of, this is one that I've enjoyed the most. I love the fact that we have an academy. In fact, I shared with them that I don't know if I could go back to just a regular church again. Like there's something about what God is doing here with the academy, with the church, with all the pieces together that makes it absolutely incredible. And yet that's what he does all the time. And that's his church. Not the building, but the building means something. But the people in the building for a specific purpose at a specific time in a specific place that Christ has set for them. And that's what we're talking about today is the church. In its many iterations, what does that look like and what do we believe it to be? And so I want to start with our statement of faith that says this. The church, 
We believe in the universal church, a living spiritual body of which Christ is the head and all regenerated persons are members. We believe in the local church, consisting of a company of believers in Jesus Christ, baptized on a credible profession of faith and associated for worship, work, and fellowship. We believe that God has laid upon the members of the local church the primary task of giving the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost world. And then you see a number of verses after that. So the church, in the very general sense, isn't the building, but it's a collection of believers that have lived all the way from the beginning of time, that have put their faith in Jesus Christ to today, and those that will continue the faith after we are gone. That's what the church is. It's universal and it's local. It's living. It's active. It's alive. And it's said in Ephesians 1, 22 through 23, described this way. God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body. The fullness of him who fills everything in every way. We, the church, are the body of Christ. Ephesians tells us that Christ has been put over us, the head of the church, for everything, which is his body, the fullness. So we are the fullness of Christ who fills everything in every way. Not a building, but a group of people that gather in a building for a specific task. The church is local and universal. It locally gathers, as I showed, in buildings all over the world to accomplish tasks that I believe Christ has specifically given us for this place at this time for this reason. It's a gathering that happens all over the world regularly in the name of Jesus. The local church, many people refer to as the Little C Church, which is then a part of the Big C Church, the Universal Church. So how do we then define what a local church looks like rather than just a gathering of people? It's been argued for many years over and over and over again that there should be a way to do church, that a church should look this way, or these are the specifics of what church is, and yet church has taken on many iterations from the beginning of time. There's been house churches, small churches, secret churches, large churches, multi-site churches, churches with schools, and many, many, many other types of churches. So is there one specific way to do church? If the body is the church, if we are the church, when we gather, is there a way that we should do it? Or are all the different iterations the way it's supposed to be? I would have to make the argument that the different iterations is exactly the way God planned it. The church should look different in different places at different times for different reasons. Why do I say that? I use the Coke and Pepsi example. I've shared this with individuals before. Coke and Pepsi have narrowed it down to really only two colas, right? You can argue RC Cola is out there. You can argue some other things like that. But they've done a really great job just gathering the market share within those two colas. And so what has that done in our world today? It's divided us, right? It's really split us. And so they've narrowed it down to two colas, and yet it would be dangerous if Pepsi swallowed Coke or Coke swallowed Pepsi. Why? Because they would miss out on a whole group of individuals, right? They would miss reaching a population that they would never get. Why? Because Coke drinkers will never drink Pepsi. And Pepsi drinkers will never drink Coke. And I have my stance on this thing. In fact, I was at a friend's house the other day who had uh, asked for a couple of us guys to come over and help with some things around the house. And so we did, and we got done, and they're doing some work, and we're kind of walking around and showed us uh, what was going on in the backyard, and we stepped out on the deck, and we didn't really have a lot of time to talk. So he's like, hey, next time we get together, we should just hang out for a little bit, plan some time to do that. I said, yeah, that would be great. I'll bring a nice cold cherry Pepsi. And his face went, oh, <laughs> yeah, no. He's like, no, you know, we're a, we're a Coke house. <laughs> and in that moment, I think we both lost a little respect for each other. <laughs> you know, there was a sense of, God, we can still be friends, but you know, my view of you has changed. In fact, right now, as soon as we leave, I'm going to take a two-hour drive to my parents' house for the next couple of days and just hang out. I have a cherry Pepsi sitting in the fridge waiting for me <laughs> so I can enjoy it on a 95-degree drive as we head south. Just is great, right? Coke is so syrupy and thick, and you kind of choke on it. <laughs> Pepsi's just sweet and just goes down so smooth. And many of you are arguing the other way, right? Right now, in your head, you're telling me why I'm wrong. We do the same thing with church. 
I think it would be a terrible mistake if the church looked the same all over the place and that we only had one church, only had two churches to, come to choose from because we'd be missing out on a whole lot of people. Because we will never be Eagle Brook. That's just the fact. We will never do that because God has not designed us to do that. We will be New Life Church, and we will continue to do school, and we will continue to do a number of ministries. And I've heard it straight from the mouth of the pastor at Eagle Brook. They will never do school, which is great. That's fantastic. In fact, I think that's awesome. I think the Bible purposely did not give us the diagram of what church should look like so that God could move through his people and make it specific to the location where they're at. And each one of us then, as a church, has a responsibility to make sure that we understand what it is that we're supposed to do. And then that we do what we're supposed to do, that we do our ministry really, really, really well. And that doesn't mean then we look at other churches and compare ourselves to other churches. We look at them and say, hey, what can I learn from them? How can I build off of them? Because they have a specific purpose too. They're there for a reason. God is using them where they're at. We're here for a reason. And we then, as individuals within the church, need to continue to wrestle and say, so what does that mean? What does that look like? And how do we live that out to the best of our ability? But at the same time, there needs to be a common framework that describes what church is. So what is a church? What differentiates a church between just a gathering of people? Well, this is one of the things that the Reformation wrestled with. They felt the church had become distorted, and they wanted to go back to the original church and say, what does that look like? And so John Calvin in his institutes said, this is the definition of church. Wherever we see the word of God purely preached and heard, and the sacraments administered according to Christ's institution, there it is not to be doubted a church of God exists. Let me read that again. Wherever we see the word of God purely preached and heard, and the sacraments administered according to Christ's institution, there it is not to be doubted a church of God exists. So what are the sacraments? We're going to talk about that next week. That was one of the major arguments of the Reformation, is what exactly did that mean? And so that was one of the definitions that was used for many, many, many years. And people have put a lot of other thoughts to it and expanded on it and developed it and fleshed it out a little bit. And then in 2008, a church planning organization of, called Acts 29, to define it for their group specifically, which is a definition that I think is done really, really well, expanded a little bit on it and said this, for our modern age, what is the church? The local church is a community of confessing believers in Jesus Christ who obey scripture by organizing under qualified leadership, gather regularly for preaching and worship, and scatter to evangelize and care for people everywhere. They observe the biblical sacraments of baptism and communion and are unified by the Spirit for the mission in the world, for their mission in the world, and are disciplined to live out the great commandment and the great commission to the glory of God. I would hold to that and say, if we were to talk about what it means to be a church rather than just a gathering of people, we need to specifically do those things. Now, church has kind of been distorted a little bit in our culture today. So why do we need to define that? Well, church is being thrown out there as something all over the place that it really isn't. In fact, the word church is somehow in our culture today becomes synonymous with the idea of community. I think that's true. Community is definitely a byproduct of church, and it's what the, we aspire to be in, but it's not the essence of church. Community is something that happens when we all gather together, but there's so much more within that. And there have been a number of people recently that have used it within songs. They used it within their mission statements, within their, their plan for their companies. They've used it in many different ways and said, we will become the church. Well, that's not possible because there's only one organization in the world that's the church, and that is the church. And the church is designed for a number of reasons. And so I would say that in our world today, as we hear the term church, we need to fight for the right definition of what the church is. We just can't use that word flippantly. Why do I say that? Because it's the only organization in the history of mankind that was ever ordained and built by Jesus Christ himself. And it needs to be upheld. It needs to be valued. In like fact, the Bible very clearly tells us that it's Jesus who builds his church. Matthew 16, 18, a very well-known verse where Jesus is talking to Peter, says, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Many people have argued the importance of Peter in this passage, and I think there's a phrase that's actually more important in this passage than the comment on Peter is this, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Who builds the church? Jesus does. 
He builds his church. He's the one that's responsible for it. And he's the one that has a plan where we're at, where other churches are at, to see his plan get lived out for all creation to see. Which is why I think it's extremely important in our world today that we uphold the idea of church, that we value church. A number of years ago, I was going through this wrestling period of trying to figure out what God had for me. And I knew at some point I was going to do something like this. Not exactly this, but I thought full-time ministry was something that I wanted to do. And I pushed into that. You may have heard the story. I've shared it with a number of you. But I pushed into it, and I struggled with it, and I wrestled with it. So I started a nonprofit to do things better than what the church was doing. And about halfway through this process of starting this nonprofit, I was sitting down with a pastor friend of mine. And we're talking about this about a year and a half into it. And he's like, you know, you're not really excited about this. I said, what do you mean? He goes, your true passion is the church. He's like, in order to change the church, don't you need to be a part of the church? And he goes, the nonprofit's going to be great. And don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to diss nonprofits in this comment. I think nonprofits are a part of what God is doing through his church, but I don't think they're the church. They're what God uses to enable his people to go out in our culture today. But there's only one organization in the world ever ordained by Jesus Christ himself, and that's the church. And then as we gather together the church, the body, within a building, our responsibility is to go do something about it, which is where I believe nonprofits and all these great things that are happening take place because people come here first and go do that second. You cannot replace the church which was happening at the beginning of the church age. In Hebrews, they're already talking about this, 10, 24 through 25. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. And here's where my heart breaks in our culture today. We live in a world where I have heard many people say, I don't need the church. Spiritually, I don't need the church. I don't need to be a part of this. I don't get anything out of it. And I have to calm myself when I hear that. Not just because I'm a pastor, but because I think that is one of the scariest lies our world tells people today. Why? Because we need each other. We can't grow spiritually. We can't be apart from this on our own as much as we can when we're together. Right? In fact, one of the scariest places in our world today is when we're alone. In fact, I may have said this before, I challenge men in their walk all the time with this. Men should never be alone, and yet our world tells us what? Men should be lone rangers. We should be guys that do it on our own. That is not the case. We can't do it alone. We were never meant to do it alone, which is why Jesus took Peter and said, on this rock, I will build my church. He didn't say, Peter, I'm going to build you up and make you awesome. He said, I'm going to use you to make this church what it needs to be because you guys need to be together. And I argue the same thing today. When I hear people say that, I sit them down and say, whoa, 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 where's that coming from? Why do you think that? And often we don't have good reasons for it. Best reason I've ever heard anybody say is the church hurt me. And that breaks my heart, too, because that goes back to, well, what is the church? The building isn't the issue. The people in the church are the issue. And that's our responsibility then to dig into each other and say, hey, if we're really family, if we really care for each other, how do we deal with this stuff? Because I know for a fact that I've hurt my brothers, I've hurt my sister, I've hurt my parents. I've hurt each and every one of them. I've never walked away from them. I've wanted to. <laughs> sure, many of you have been there. And yet because we're forced to be together, there's this blood relationship, there's this connection. We go back to it, we figure it out, we wrestle it for the most part. And yet if we don't, I know people that have had situations in their life where they haven't been able to reconcile with their, their family. They have had relationships that have hurt them, where they've had to walk away from them within the family structure. Guess what I hear over and over and over again? It's painful. It hurts. I wish it had never happened. Do we care about each other that way? Are we connected to each other that way? Do we love each other that way? And that's what the church is. It's a family. And we need to be in this together because when we talk about community and talk about the understanding of church, there is no other place in the world where you will experience that other than right here. 
And so when we walk away from it and we try to do something different, when we try to be somebody on our own, we're never going to be what we could be within the church because we need each other. The church today is extremely important because Jesus built it, because we need it, and then it has specific purposes in our world today. And I think there's three specific things that as a church it's our responsibility to do on a regular basis. First one is worship God. I believe that worship is one of the key essence of life on earth. In fact, probably the thing that we were meant to do, that we were to live as God's, or live for God's glory, as God's creation to show the world who he is. One of the things that I love about the Old Testament, there's a lot of things. We're going to be in the Old Testament quite a bit here in this next year. One of the things that you see within the Old Testament is they knew how to worship. Man, they knew how to worship. And one person in particular, it was David. I love reading the story of David because David knew how to worship. In fact, you read through the Psalms, it's David <clears throat> crying out to God. It's David showing his emotions. It's David praising God for who he is. And you see his life for all the things that he did wrong, for all the things that he didn't necessarily do and you'd ever want to emulate. He did one thing right, and that was worship. He knew how to do it. And there's one specific passage in 1 Chronicles chapter 16 that I've read over and over and over again. I want to read a part of it with you this morning. So if you open up your Bibles of 1 Chronicles 16, I'm not going to have it on the screen. If you want a Bible, I've got one for you. There's some on the back there. If you want to grab one on your way out, you can download it on your app. We uh, have the Bible app that we use on Sundays, but I believe it's important that we get into the Bible specifically so we can see what God is doing. And one of the things he challenges us to is worship. First Chronicles 16, Jesus, or David, sorry, David was a precursor to Jesus, so that worked. Um, David, his desire in life was to worship God. And there's a moment here in First Chronicles that's recorded where he's bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. And there's a previous moment where he's been worshiping as the Ark's been coming into Jerusalem. And there's this whole part where David dances, and his wife at the time thinks it's inappropriate which I love this passage. I've read a number of times because there was a song growing up by a group called Spoken. And the title of the song was, Oh God, I Want to Dance Like David. And it was one of those bands that Grant got into before he got into his band. So if you know anything about Grant's band, you know, it was one of those songs. It was pretty intense. But the chorus of the, the song just screamed out, Oh God, I want to dance like David. And I remember listening to that song over and over and over again, the cry of my heart being, God, I want to dance like David. And I've implemented that in my life. If you've ever seen, I think my wife's probably posted a couple videos on Facebook. If you're in our house for an extended period of time, you're going to hear music and you're going to see us dancing around. In fact, just the other day, uh, one of the traditions we've had for a number of years is to turn the music up really, really loud, and I'd pick up my little kids, and I'd dance around the house. They're getting too big to pick up. <laughs> They're not little anymore, and yet... We had a song on that's one of our favorites the other day, and my nine-year-old came running at me, and she said, pick me up. And I picked her up, and we danced around the house. And after just a couple minutes, I said, I got to put you down. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when they hit that 50, 60, 70-pound mark, you just can't. As we talk about the church, we talk about what our responsibility is. And if the church is the people, our responsibility as individuals is to worship. And David knew how to do that. In First Chronicles 16, I'm just going to read a portion of it, 23 through 36, it says this. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his dwelling place. Ascribe to the Lord all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. 
The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let the trees of the forest sing. Let them sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Cry out, save us, God our Savior. Gather us and deliver us from the nations. That we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. So I just need to make one quick comment, just real fast. (laughs) I think this is funny. It happens every time. I want you guys to pay attention to this. My dad firmly believes that the devil uses cell phones and babies. (laughs) No joke. Right? You get into an awesome part of the service, you get into a powerful moment, and all of a sudden a phone rings or a baby cries. It happens every time. <laughs> every time. So I've gotten to the point now where I praise the Lord. I'm so thankful a phone rang. You know what that means? God's moving. God is working. When his word is read, the devil needs to stop it. I love that passage because it talks about praising the Lord and the ark is coming into Jerusalem and David has this group of individuals sing this song of praise and this is part of this. And one of the things that I love, now living in Minnesota, it is even more real. Verse 33 says, let the trees of the forest sing. Let them sing for joy before the Lord. These inanimate objects all of a sudden have life. Let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant. As we sit here at this time of year, as the trees are coming to life, as we see the wind blowing through the trees, as we can witness the earth singing the praise of the Lord, it becomes so much more powerful. I love just going to the parks here in the area, and that's one of the beauty of the thing of of Woodbury, of what we have here locally in Minnesota. Afton, Stillwater, all these places, you can go and just be outside and see God's glory. My challenge to you this week, even though it's going to be 95 degrees outside, Go and just stand in awe of who God is and view the trees differently as the winds go through them. See them as singing the praise of God. That we as a group of individuals, we as the church, as individuals within the church, as the body, as the world, our responsibility is to praise. It's to worship. Every Sunday, as a church, when we gather, we do that from very beginning to very end. Worship on Sunday mornings is not just the songs we sing. It's every element that we put into the service. It's everything that we do when we get here. And our desire is that you guys are here from beginning all the way to end. In fact, I was talking to an individual today who walked in and was going to save seats. And I'm like, that's awesome. And then I actually made the comment, but you're not going to need to. It's Memorial Day. And he's like, oh, you should be more positive. I said, okay, I'm positive. You won't need to save seats. It's Memorial Day. (laughs) And yet the room is full. It's exciting to be here. We come to worship. We come to praise. So we do sing. That's part of it. That's part of worship. But every Sunday we give because that's also part of it. We open up God's word. We read what he has said to us. We have communion once a month. We pray. We do all sorts of different things. And as we leave this place today, we don't just do this when we gather as the church. But our responsibility as the church is to do this all the time. If we, the body, are the church and our number one priority is to worship, we can't just reserve that for Sunday morning. We need to do that every day of the week through all these different things. We need to sing regularly. We need to give regularly. We need to read our Bible regularly. We need to be in communion with each other regularly. And we need to be praying regularly. And what do I mean regularly? We should be doing it daily. Daily. In fact, force yourself or try to get yourself doing it hourly. Could you do that? Can we start implementing these things where everything we do is worship? I've had an opportunity recently to do a project uh, on our house. And so I don't get a chance to do things with my hands a lot. So when I do, I really love it. 
and it was mundane. I was just sitting there refinishing some cabinets, and we have 44 doors on our cabinets. That's just ridiculous. And they got the creases in them, and you got to use the little, you know, special brush. And yet, it was unbelievable opportunity to sit there and praise, worship. God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for this opportunity to worship you. Thank you for this home you've provided for us. Thank you for this community. Thank you for this church. Thank you for who you are. So the church worships. The church also builds each other up. Number two, the church builds up the body. The church was designed to do this. We can't forsake the gathering of the church. We can't forsake gathering together because we need to encourage each other. We need to build each other up. Colossians 3, 12 through 17 says this. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. We're meant to gather. We're meant to encourage each other. We're meant to challenge each other, to forgive each other, to do all these different things. So whose role is it to do this? Who's responsible for this? Is it the staff of the church? One of the downfalls of thinking of the church as a building is then thinking of the people that work in the church as the church. And that's something that I've experienced over a number of years, and that's something that I want to make sure that we as a church don't do. That we are in this together, that we are the church together. I think the Bible very clearly talks about that. That it's not the church, it's, or it's not the staff of the church, it's not individuals that are in the key volunteer roles, it's everybody. And until we get everybody involved and everybody together working towards a common goal, we will not see fruit the way that we were designed to see it. I think the Bible tells us that this is exactly the way it was designed, that individuals have different roles within it, but each one of us has a part. For what purpose? To build each other up. 1 Corinthians 12, 7. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Ephesians 4, 11 through 13. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Again, we see Christ as the head of the church. Who's ordained that? Who's put those individuals there? Christ himself has. And what's, it, what's the purpose? To serve and equip his people for works of service so that everybody should be involved. 1 Peter 4.10 Each one should use whatever gift he's received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Each one, every single one of us, if you believe that Jesus Christ, your personal Lord and Savior, has a spiritual gift that's been designed for a specific purpose, for the building up of each other, to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. In the fall, we're going to do a spiritual gift series. We're going to start in September, and we're talking through what are spiritual gifts. And we're going to be working through our Sunday school classes and a number of different uh, avenues and venues that we're going to be challenging everybody to take a spiritual gift survey. That we together want to know what our gifts are and then find where they fit and how we can use them and how we can come together. Because if we've each been given a gift, then we need to be using that in community. When we gather, we must sing. You don't want me doing that. But we've got amazing people that do do that, and we need more of those individuals. We must exhort, we must encourage, we must support, prepare each other for God's work, for his service, designed specifically for this location. One of the tough things about church that happens, though, is it's easy to come in on a Sunday and see things going really, really well and think, oh, they don't need me. Well, more often than not, we're just holding it together. <laughs> we need every single one of you. We have amazing volunteers that are here, but there are needs all the time. But here's what I don't want to do. I don't just want to challenge you and say, hey, we have a need here, fill it. I want to make sure that each one of us in our passion and our gifts are excited about that need. And there may be a time to push you into a place where you're uncomfortable and say, hey, it's time to grow. Like right now, we have needs in our tech department. How many people know how to run a soundboard for all the band up here? Anybody? One of you. 
then Maggie does a great job. We need more of those individuals. And maybe you've never done it before, and you're like, oh, we could use individuals running the slides up here. How many people have ever clicked a mouse button before? Come on. <laughs> Guess what? You're qualified to do that. <laughs> really easy, right? But we need individuals that can do that. Youth, we're looking for five more leaders next year. We've got a youth program that is growing by leaps and bounds, and we need individuals to step in to continue to train this next generation. Speaking of the next generation, our children's ministry, we could always use help there. We need everybody to be a part of it. But then it goes on and on and on. Teachers for Sunday school classes, life group leaders, individuals who can lead midweek Bible studies. There are plenty of needs here, and yet I want to make sure That it's not because we have a void and we're putting a body in it, but each one of you is where you're supposed to be. Because when we see that happen and the church comes together, it's powerful. And then our responsibility as we come together, as we challenge each other, as we encourage each other, is to go. Number three, it's to share the good news with the world. Right before Jesus left, he gave this commandment to his disciples in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And then Acts 1, 6 through 8. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the time or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We talked about the last things and where that's going. We talked about our church's stance on that, and yet we also said that in the meantime, we have something to do. And Jesus specifically here says that time is coming when the kingdom will be restored, but until then... As you've received power in the Spirit, you must go. Be witnesses in all of the world. And that's our hope as a church, that we will do those three things. That as individuals and as a body together, that we will worship. That we will dance like David. That we will praise. That we will sing. That we will build each other up within our gifting. That we will challenge each other. We will exhort each other. That we will support each other. We will encourage each other. We will cry with each other. And then ultimately, that we will love each other enough to send each other out. And that every Sunday when we would get together, that's my prayer, that as we leave, we are going somewhere where God, where God will use us. And I know he will. Why? Because he builds his church. And he has put us here in Woodbury, Minnesota, for the last 41 years, and hopefully for many, many, many more years to come, for a very specific purpose. And I say this to each and every one of you today. You are not here by mistake. God has brought you here as part of his church for a reason. To be used. To worship. To use your gifting. And then to go be an example of Christ's love for us as we share it with the whole world. That's going to be the focus of our next series. We're going to be talking about the here, near, and far aspect of our mission statement. And we're going to have a number of missionaries with us through the summer. Cool thing is we've got a number of them back, and we're going to do some question and answer up here on stage with them, and they're going to share stories with you of what God is doing. But we're going to be talking about the here, near, and far. What is God doing here in Woodbury? What is God doing near locally? And what is God doing far away in places many of us will never be? I had a chance to meet with one of our missionaries a number of weeks ago, and he invited me to come along and visit where he's at. And I said, so, you know, how do you get there? Because it's quite a ways away. And he's like, well, it's a 36-hour trip. I said, oh, that's it? <laughs> and I said, is that, is that the flight? And he goes, no, the flight's 20 hours. I said, okay. And then he goes, and then it's an eight-hour boat ride, and then it's a four-hour car ride, and then it's a four-hour hike. And I went, okay. And then, he, and then he looks at me and said, and you could bring your kids if you wanted. <laughs> I will get right on that. <laughs> Chances are I'll never be where he has been. And that's fine. Because the reality of life is I will probably never be where you guys have been. I will not talk to the people that you guys have talked to. 
I will not interact with your family members, and yet summer is one of the best times to do that. The world comes alive. We interact with people. We have barbecues with people. We go visit people. And when we do, we need to go in the name of Jesus and be witnesses for him to the ends of the earth. And that's why we say here, near, and far. Because when Jesus said Jerusalem, it was here. When he said Judea and Samaria, it was near. And then he said to the ends of the earth, which is far. And so we want to be a church that does that, that sends people out in the name of Christ as we worship him together, as we build each other up, and then as we go, that we do it as the church in this building, and then we do it as the church as we go. So to sum it all up, as we finish today, I want you guys to take a look at this video. Lately, it seems that we are getting more and more confused about what a church actually is. So let's take some time to set the record straight. Church is not a building, though a building can be used by a church. Church is not a denomination, though a set of beliefs should be important to a church. Church is not about Sunday, though a church should not forsake meeting together. Church is not about one person or personality, though every church should be pastored. And church is not about size or growth, though every church is called to make disciples. So don't think of church as an address or a location, but rather think of church as mobile and on the move. Don't think of church as something built or planted, but rather think of church as something deployed. Don't think of church as where you are for an hour each week, but rather what you are every day of the week, because the church is the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Feet shouldn't sit still. Hands shouldn't be idle. Feet go. Hands do. This is the church. Church isn't what you're sitting through right now, because you are the church. Now go and be the church.